The Africville relocation was presented as a liberal and humanitarian measure to improve the living conditions of underprivileged people. What went wrong? You're listening to Africville Forever. In season one, we told you the story of the destruction of my community. They cheated us, and I'm one that was cheated. If you don't move at a certain time, we'll bring out the bulldozers and push your shacks over. In season two, we are exploring its rebirth. I know we'd all fight to get back out there. We still call it home. My name is Eddie Carvey III, and my grandfather, the original Eddie Carvey, has maintained the longest civil rights protest in North American history. It's time that we looked at them wrong and righted them. He stood up for Africville since it was destroyed in the 1960s, refusing to leave the land. For too long, the Africville survivors and descendants have been divided, hampering our efforts to take back the land and rebuild our unique community. So please join us as we explore practical, inclusive solutions to reunite our people and once again rebuild our community. Can we get you to end on the note of, let's hear Africville forever. Africville forever and a day. In this episode, we will urgently be addressing a new development that has shocked and divided the community once again. The future of the land of Africville and how it will be used is in jeopardy. The fight is far from done. And in the next few months, it could decide whether Africville will rise as a community again or be frozen in time as a historical monument. Okay, folks. We'll begin our meeting with a little uh, moment of silent reflection. This episode might be a little more, I would say, sharp and straight to the point on our opinions and your opinions and what you've experienced recently. And so, you know, let's just dive into it. How did you hear about the hearing that was taking place at City Hall? Oh, man, this is uh, this was quite like a kerfuffle of a time for me. Um, The day prior to me learning about the hearing that was taking place, my sister actually had passed away in a tragic car accident. So my mind was already in a million and one different places. You, uh, You reached out to me the following day, probably, you know, I'd say around 10 a.m., and um, let me know what was going on. I quickly looked on the city's website and saw that there was a hearing um, involving the Africville Heritage Trust requesting some more land. So, we only really have the public hearing, but we're going to go through our normal orders of the day. I want to begin by acknowledging we're in uh, Mi'kma'ki, the traditional, the unsurrendered land of the Mi'kmaq people. And, we- and um, immediately, you know, in the emotional state I was already in, I was kind of held back, but knew that I had to go be in attendance and a presence at this hearing. Um, So what was the hearing about? Can you just clarify that? The hearing was to discuss what? What the Heritage Trust proposed was they needed land to build a larger parking lot and a marina. Uh, Mayor Savage and Council, this public hearing is with respect to the land and water portion of lot H3, which is along Africville Road. It's for its uh, surplus disposal. And the legislation that uh, dictates the disposal is Halifax Regional Municipality Charter. Back in, what, 2021, we launched a collective action campaign that had over 5,000 people, both locally and around the world, say to city council that something needs to happen at Africville and that people there need to get access back to their land. Yes. And And then about, what, eight months later, the city announced the revisioning process. Exactly. And, and, you know, it was my understanding that it was going to be a a much more inclusive process that could at least let the descendants and the survivors of Africville all have a voice in the decisions moving forward. And so with that, it was the potential to explore what could be done with the land. And from the various meetings we had with councillors, the mayor, uh, different politicians, 
I was under the understanding that nothing would be done with lands until after this revisioning process. And now mind you, when the hearing had taken place, the revisioning process, the actual legwork was just about underway, right? Like it, it had just begun. Actually, the hearing, I believe, was on a Wednesday, and that Saturday was the first time that Ignite had brought the community together as a whole to discuss what the revisioning process meant and what it could it mean is, for everybody. Uh, we don't have enough property, and one of the one of the things that we experience for any of you that have been to Africville is even though we are trying to encourage uh, buses, and buses do come, but we want the uh, the tourism buses uh, from the cruise ships, uh, etc. One of the problems we have is the size of our parking lot. It's, uh, it's very difficult uh, for buses to, one, to park there, and if they do park there in the... the what so I text you, and I send you a link to something I saw, and I say, hey, man, did you know this is happening? And so from that point, what do you do? Well, I did the same thing what you did. It was probably two, two and a half hours until the time of the hearing. So immediately I started cramming my mind with as much information about what was happening as I possibly could. And that's when I realized that the Heritage Trust back in December of 23 had put this motion forward to the city for a potential land swap or however you want to call it to um, gain more of the land that once belonged to the community of Africville. So now walk us through what happened when you got there. What did you experience? What was happening? Tell us like step by step. What was that like? Uh, Well, I informed my family. That was the first thing I did. And my son was actually in the car when my uh, significant other picked me up and he wanted to come. Like he wanted to be a part of that. He is, you know, witness this journey that you and I've been on for the past four or five years. From there, I uh, let my father know and in hopes that we could catch my grandfather because, you know, he's here, there, and everywhere in between. So it's not to my surprise, but to the general public's surprise, nobody else knew about this hearing, right? When I, we did find him, he was down at the Hope Cottage. He uh, he was shocked, and, you know, he's not in the best health, but immediately he stiffened up like the soldier that he is, and he was ready to go say his piece. He didn't listen to anything I told him because I said, Randy, you're, you're going to need your ID. He said, what ID? I'm Eddie Kerr, right? Like this. So he just, he proceeded to stick with it. And uh, by no means, like they weren't telling him no. And we got down there. Of course, they were asking him for his ID. And eventually they let us upstairs into the chamber. And like I said, it wasn't to a surprise, but I was very disappointed. This is something that is very, very critical, very crucial to the possibility of, you know, rebuilding the community actually changing the lives of our people for the better and there wasn't nobody there on the opposing side of what the heritage trust was proposing this is a historical injustice that affected the lives of hundreds if not thousands of people over time yeah for sure there's only five people there to speak on it again if if you wouldn't have sent me that message, then nothing would have changed. It, they would have heard no opposing voice. And this wasn't coming from a place of aggression or, you know, anger. It's just to try to let the city councilors know. And pretty much this was the first time I got to address the Heritage Trust because through our work, through everything I've done, I've never even had the opportunity to sit down and have a conversation with them to let them know, you know, there's a, a bigger picture to look at here. Thank you all for uh, giving me this opportunity. My name is Eddie Carvery III. There's not many descendants of Africa present here today. And myself, I had just found out about this public hearing around lunchtime today. So while the Africa Heritage Trust may have good intentions, they do not fully involve our community in any decision-making aspect of what they do. I felt I had to speak to the larger population of descendants who aren't happy with how things have been for the past 50 years. And as the Heritage Trust tries to push forward with, you know, accumulating as much of that land as possible, it limits the opportunity for the descendants of Africville to go home, to have their community. Why? Why does it limit that opportunity? Because as of right now, um, Africville is a na- national historic 
landmark. So when you start putting designations on places like that, it, it limits the ability to do certain things on the land. Back in 2022, Nelson Carvery and I explored the area planned to be turned into this new marina. As an elder, Nelson had many stories and memories that bring the land back to life. My name is Nelson Carvery. I was born in 1942 in Africville here. My father was Pa Aaron Carvery, the last person to leave Africville. In 1970, I think he got out. Judging by the church a little bit farther down, and up where the signs was, that's yeah. where I live. Yeah, yeah, up yeah. in the back of there, yeah. Eh? yeah. This little piece of land is actually yeah. named after me. Yeah? <laughs> the brown girls called it Nelson's, because yeah. I always had a boat here. This is where, yeah, this yeah, is so where this, we this, is, this is actually mine. Yeah. <laughs> like so we're, we're kind of claiming this as our own. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. Nelson Carvery Cove. <laughs> Nelson Carvery Cove, you hear that? And I think it's important to acknowledge the, the fact before this, what the Africville Heritage Trust has brought to you all, before it gets passed and accepted, I think it's important to understand, to uh, recognize also the motion that Councillor Smith did bring forward and the process that we're undergoing right now, and that is the revisioning process of Africville. And though, like I said, intentions with the Heritage Trust may be well, they're not inclusive of every voice of Africville. And I know myself, the real ancestors of Africville, my grandfather's parents, you know, the, the older generation who was an adult when the community was taken, they're turning in their grave because we are still divided amongst ourselves and it can no longer be accepted. What is the alternative to what they're proposing right now? What is the alternative? I, it sounds like there's a conflict between the history and the heritage versus the future yeah so maybe paint a picture of what the flip side is what is the future what could the future look like um okay well uh you see to understand where you're going you got to know where you're from and so a lot of these people who represent these organizations were young children at the time of africa's destruction so the concept that they um, had in their mind might not have been a fully developed one of what was happening. But when I hear stories about my great-grandmother and the other real elders of Africville, there was never a desire to just, you know, put a stamp on, say sorry, leave Africville in the past. There was always a constant pursuit to return home and not only return home, but return home with the things that were constantly denied from us. And those elders were prepared to fight every single day for that. They wanted, and, and at, at that time, they, they were in their elder age. So they weren't fighting for themselves to return home. They were fighting for their children, their children's children, to have a place to call home, a community that, you know, you, you learn to respect one another, love one another, support one another. And so for me, building off the back of, the strength of that generation. It's important to see what kind of place we are in today in society itself. And as I had mentioned, you know, there's industry right on our front doorstep. Like, obviously, the, nobody, there was no real consultation for the port to put that sequestrian land out there. But now that it's there, let's do something positive that could turn it into a certain type of development that could provide jobs, economic opportunity for the descendants of Africville. Let's explore what potential housing could look like on uh, what remains yes, of the land. And I think, uh, Councillor Hensby, we are well aware of the property, and I, I want to piggyback on, on what staff has already said, is that uh, the discussion around these uh, two pieces of land, A and B, uh, commenced back in 2018. So we are not walking into this blindly. We are fully aware of what we are going to propose uh, in the future uh, for these uh, two parcels of land, uh, which make up part of H3. What fear do you have about UNESCO uh, designation like 
What does that mean? That means it opens the door. It's the same path that they took when they, the Heritage Trust decided to make the church a museum. It opens that funding opportunity. But this time, it's n and, and usually it's more so for um, caretakers of the land in a sense, right? So, but this time with that UNESCO designation, it, it doesn't only just help Africville. And that's why those city councilors, when Piercy had mentioned that they had already applied in hopes by the end of the summer that they were going to be granted this designation. City councilors smiled too because this is a world heritage designation. And so that means that you would be able to receive funding both f for that specific place of land, but also the city themselves could then use the funding they could try to get more land and, or try to get more money i mean yeah try to try to get more funding through these opportunities that this designation provides so it's a win for the city it's a win for the heritage trust which the genealogy society conceptualized who works hand in hand with the city for the city however you want to put that across so Everybody who has their hands in a, someone else's pocket that's, you know, pulling something out and not starving or, you know, have, facing addiction problems, whatever the case may be, they're going to benefit from something like that. Well said. It sounds like there's a lot of attention being put on the past and the heritage and the history, and you want there to be an equal focus on the future and opportunity and growth. A hundred percent. And see, this is this is the kicker. On top of that, right now, Halifax itself is going through a major transformation. There's the Windsor Street Exchange Program, which is an intersection in Halifax, which is really close to Africville. And that sees potentially 70,000 vehicles pass through there every single day. That's right on Africville's front doorstep. So to rework future developments that could potentially benefit Africville into these projects is still very possible but we're running out of time. The Halifax Port Authority, they're making an interconnected rail between the South End Container Terminal and the one that's in Fairview Cove, which is on Africville Lane. Now, for us to fill gaps, whether it be through, you know, sustainable transportation, storage, it could be many different things. And, and for me, just to say what I personally think it could be, that's unfair to everybody. The potential is just enormous. There's so many things that could be developed that could, again, you know, change that generational trauma back into generational wealth. It's not going to be overnight, but unless you start, it's only going to continue to get worse. Because what we're seeing now is the places where the descendants of Africville were di displaced into, you know, these public housing units. Well, now everybody's getting old, growing, growing up. The kids aren't kids anymore. So now there's one or two people in a three, four bedroom house and they're making them leave these areas which became their new home. So we're becoming even further displaced. We're losing that sense of community. And we need to find a way, and, and like I said, opportunity is the best way to bring everybody back together. Because right now, for the most part, people from my community, they only see one way out. And it's never, you know, it's never can't say the right thing it isn't really legally it's not but it's the only thing that can change your life and we need to remove the focus from that and show these next generation even the current generation that there is opportunities elsewhere that you can provide for your family and change your lives and the community's lives right. and again it won't be overnight but unless we start taking the positive steps in that redevelopment direction potential new development, exploring how our people can get involved in the marine industry, well then, we're going to be locked in a place of time. We're going to be a memory, a footnote, and nothing more, nothing less. We're going to be dispersed more across this place, and we're going to continuously fall into a trap that was placed upon our ancestors many, many years ago, and we're still living through those consequences. And the only way that we can fix it is through our own, is through ourselves. I'm not here for recognition. And just like my grandfather, you may hear some request of, you know, acknowledgement for the sacrifices he made. I'm here to speak for the community. And in the same time, I, 
I question the mandates of the Heritage Trust. I question their capacity to be able to develop land. Their mandates include preservation of our history. There's not many descendants here to, to, to tell you how they feel, to express their concerns, or maybe even give their input of what should happen with these lands. It's, it's not a select group of people who should decide for a large community. And the ones that are making decisions for our community live very comfortably. They don't go home to the houses in Uniac Square. No, they go home to homes which they own. You know, they have equity. They have things to leave to their children and their children's children. The people of Africville are still fighting with invisible shackles on their hands, on their feet. And in, in, in the, your mind, it may be hard to conceive, but what that means is they're still dealing with bad problems with alcohol abuse, you know, crime-related activities, uh, drug abuse. And, and these are things that... You cannot move forward until you deal with what's holding the majority back. The people of Africville, but we never wanted a monument to, to represent our future. We wanted to create our future. We wanted to bring forward the potential to really redevelop Africville. So before you make your decision to move ahead, please reconsider the fact that there is a revisioning process happening right now as we speak and to potentially hold off on this decision until at least that revisioning process is complete for the sake of Africville as a whole. This journey of this podcast has been beautiful for me. I want to thank the producers here at Podstarter, Reese, Connor, Amina, and John, everybody on their team. I'd like to personally thank Tribe Network because without you guys, none of this would have been taking place. I want to thank each and every single person who took time out of their day to listen to the words and the guests of our podcast. Lastly, but of course, most importantly... If you do ever get a chance to visit the lands of Africa, there's a monument down there. It's a sundial, but on that monument bears the names of those who lived in the land of Africa. So I want to thank them, each and every person from every single one of those families, for their constant persistence, you know, their hard work, dedication to come back to the land, to love one another, and to regrow our community to what it once was. Thank you all for tuning in. This is only the beginning.